Hey, this is Benjamin Boyce, and I have a week of gender issues for you today. I guess we're continuing with the gender issues. I guess 2019 week four is just going to be a gender issues week. Uh, I have some interviews with feminists, but not this one. This one's an interview with a masculinist. Actually, he's just a professor of masculinity in the UK. His name is Eric Anderson. In this interview, we get into sports and we get into what is a man. We get into the large scale media misandry that is being promulgated right now. We also debunk toxic masculinity and among other things. This is a host of different topics around what it means to be a man. We also get into the bromance too. Um, apparently, it's okay to cuddle with your dude bros. Um, I didn't know that until this interview. So, um, you know, here we go. Hope you enjoy. I feel much more comfortable in the fact that I like to snuggle with soft objects after this interview. And that in no way detracts from my utter manliness, as you might imagine. So manly. Here we go. You kind of like Jon Snow with that coat on. I like it. Isn't he the uh, former prime minister? Uh, he's a main character in Game of Thrones, the wildly ah. successful fantasy. I'm um, probably not allowed to drink beer while on, on YouTube, am I? You're absolutely allowed to drink beer. It's too early for me to drink beer because of the time change. Ah, fair enough. How did you end up in the UK? You do not have a British accent. Ah, you are wise. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, my ears are trained. Yeah, no, um, I did my PhD in California and uh, did a postdoc in New York and then was on the market looking for a job basically anywhere in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. You know, in the academic profession, you have to go where the jobs are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not everybody wants a scholar on masculinity. So, mm. you know, you have to, you have to move. So I yeah. uh, ended up in England. So 13 you... years ago though now. Okay. And so yeah. you're, you're well integrated into that yeah. posh society? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a good quality of life over here. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the the job doesn't pay as much, but hey, you know, you get you get health care provided and yeah. Uh, you know, there's no guns and everybody's a bit more mellow and you work a lot fewer hours and a lot fewer weeks. So Which gives yeah. you more time for um, for family because I've got a husband yeah. and two children. Oh, okay. So we travel to California. So, you know, for example, I spend I spend uh, 6 or 7 weeks in California every summer. Oh, yeah. You know that's not a problem. We get eight pay, we get eight paid holiday weeks a year over here. There you go. Isn't that amazing? I that's mean, wonderful. you know, it's it's great if you're the employee. I, I I wouldn't want to be an employer giving somebody eight paid weeks a year to do no work for me. But yeah, hey, yeah. as the employee, it works out great. Are you? Uh, is your particular university uh, uh, pressure you to publish? Um, they don't have to. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm a a uh, highly prolific publisher okay. by my own desire just because I love doing it. I love research. I love writing. I love publishing. I love the media. Uh, so I'm, I'm by far the most prolific publisher at my university. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, quite a, you know, you can check out my, my website, which is professor Eric Anderson.com. You can put it in the we will. YouTube thing if you want. And, uh, but yeah, I've got just an unbelievable amount of publications for the 14 years since I've earned the PhD. And um, mainly, what, articles, papers, uh, uh, monographs? 19 books oh, and um, 75 peer-reviewed journal articles. There we go. You're so the man. You, I, I, I know you've probably interviewed, I've I watched a couple of your uh, things, um, but certainly you interviewed James Cantor as a friend yeah. of mine. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's a pretty stellar rate for the academic world. And, um, yeah, I just like, I like what I do. I like and changing the world. Is it mostly in masculinity or tees? Yeah, masculinities, sexualities, sport. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, a variety of interests um, from monogamy and why men cheat on their on their partners and why cheating is a good thing. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, bisexuality, the increased acceptance of bisexuality, mm -hmm. um, problematizing team sports, looking at the you know the problems that team sports cause that we don't readily think about. Uh, particularly in relationship to concussion and other forms of brain trauma. Okay. So my take on sport is that sport reflects the society from which it comes. So if you look at ancient sports, they reflect warrior sports because we needed to train young boys to be warriors. If you look at modern sports in the Western world, you know we we began to value baseball, football, rugby, 
And these are a reflection of the fact that we needed uh, children to work in industry uh, around the turn of the 20th century. We needed to prepare children for standing armies. And because in 1905, Sigmund Freud came up with this, you know, well, it made sense at the time, but we now realize it's preposterous. This idea that, you know, the absence of the father figure was making boys gay. And so we had these these three reasons that corresponded in the turn of the 20th century. And, you know, prior to, let's go with the mid-1800s, the late 1800s, we didn't value sport. We didn't, we didn't play sport. You know, a few rich people played a few leisurely activities. Mm-hmm. In terms of this belief that we need to put kids into organized competitive sport, that was both, both a waste of God's time, because any leisure time should be spent studying the Bible, and also highly impractical because people lived in urban areas, they were spread out, and they were too busy farming and didn't have time for sport. Yeah. But with the Industrial Revolution, people now are living in inner cities. Man you know, goes to work, clocks out, has some spare time, starts to kick the ball around with his mates. And you have this growth of sport around the turn of the 20th century. Hmm. And that type of sport highly reflected the ethos of that time. But if you look at all the new sports, um, you know, the sports that kids value at my university today, the number one sport is uh, frisbee, ultimate frisbee, okay. which is a co-educational sport. Um, non-contact boys and girls together. Okay. Co-education. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, and, uh, dodgeball, uh, you know, and there's all sorts of, you know, sports today aren't this same sort of macho ram your head into another man. Okay. Yeah. Kind of sports as they used to be. Yeah. So if you, if you just think about, you know, to what sports was, what sport was most commonly played, uh, and participated in by youth at the turn of the 20th century. And it was boxing you know, literally beating the shit out of each other. Hmm. And today, the most common sport is, you know, like swimming, you know, running, walking, cycling. Yeah, uh, more you know, so competing sports. almost against yourself in a certain yeah. respect. Yeah, youth today are dropping out of these organized competitive team sports at a pretty rapid rate. And it's for several reasons. One is they don't want the damage that comes with bashing bodies together. Mm-hmm. It's sensible, you know. The second is they don't want to be told what to do by a coach. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. they want to have more autonomy in their sporting preferences. And, and and number three is they're doing less sport full stop in all capacities and more, you know. Well, yeah, with- that's that was my next question. What do you think about eSports, the uh, comp- competitive gaming? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's no, nobody's going to have a concussion doing that, are they? Yeah. And, uh, you know, clearly for some individuals, it can be problematic. I'm certainly not going to call it an addiction. But for some individuals, they probably spend far too much time, you know, doing the leisurely pursuit of online gaming. Mm -hmm. But for most individuals, it's a, you know, it's a recreational pursuit. I highly recommend that they do it while standing at a desk or (laughs) my desk with a treadmill underneath the desk so that they can actually get their bodies moving while they're playing (laughs) sports. But uh, yeah, you're not going to find me coming down against pornography and video games. Well, I was wondering about what would esports reflect about the current culture right now. If you've done any thought about that, there are very there are a variety of different kinds of games in the virtual world. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't know if you've you've thought about that and how it reflects on society. No, I haven't. Uh, good questions. Yeah, um, I mean, fundamentally, regardless of what the nature of what happens on screen is you know, bodies aren't colliding. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that, you know, that makes me happy. Yeah. Because, so the I, dam- you know, the damage that comes from brains colliding, even yeah. at subconcussive yeah. forces, we now know definitively, we now know has dire consequences on individuals long term health. On development there is no such as thing well as maintenance of the brain. Absolutely. There, there's no such things as recovering from a concussion. The brain doesn't heal in that capacity. Huh. So we've done a large, scale, a large scale study in Sweden with hundreds of thousands of twin sets. So you know, you've controlled for all the environmental conditions that way. And those who've had one concussion or more have substantially reduced health outcomes, have higher rates of crime, higher rates of requirements for the state's intervention financially. So mm-hmm. their, their life outcome is significantly lower compared to their siblings who've not had a concussion. And, you know, if that doesn't tell you something with a large scale study like that, you know, what? I don't know what would. Yeah. It's common sense. You know, I tell my students, hey, can I borrow your iPhone? Can I just take your iPhone and bash it against the wall a few times? <laughs> and they say, hell no. And I say, then why are you willing to do that with a football, bouncing a football off your head or smacking your head into another player over and over again? It's like, yeah. you know, 
yeah. give your brain the same courtesy you give your iPhone. So I, I contacted you because of uh, masculinity, broadly speaking, yes. but specifically about the APA guidelines on, for boys and men. Have you gone through that? And if not, then we can just talk about your research into masculinity. Sure. Now, I've looked at the, uh, the guidelines that the APA came out with, and they were, um, they were not scientific. And it's very evident to me as a social scientist that there's been a creep of social justice warriors, of people who are more interested in um, doctrine than they are in data, hmm. um, emerging within the social sciences. And, um, and at the same time, there's been increased willingness to berate men as a whole, as a class, um, in ways that we don't do with other groups of people. And it's a liberal driven agenda and it's finding its way into the social sciences. And I'm not thoroughly surprised by the APA's statement. Um, now what I'm not versed in, so I won't speak to, is I understand that sort of the you know, the the, the thumb screws were put to the APA and they went back and sort of then, you know, try to requalify and qualify as to what these statements meant, yeah. which basically led them to describe, you know, Toxic masculinity is psychopathy, which is already known as psychopathy. Okay, so, you know, so it, it's a it was a it was a preposterous statement by the by the APA. They said that toxic masculinity is basically something that they're going to put in the that that manual that diagnostics manual. Right, DSMR. The DSMR. So they they painted themselves in the corner like now we're going to describe the patriarchy as some sort of unconscious uh, pathology that's creeping through. Do you think that that's where they're going to have but, to go? Let, let me look. I'm not. I'm not a psychologist. I'm a sociologist. Okay. Right. And and I take great homage at, you know, what psychologists have done and continue to do, and that is essentially psychologists take things that are a normal part of daily life, and they pathologize them. Mm -hmm. So do you know that the DSMR once qualified slaves who tried to way who tried to run away from their masters as having a, a disorder? Hmm. Right. You know, the same DSMR pathologized homosexuality as being a disorder. Right. So essentially what psychologists do, um, and I don't mean all psychologists, but, you know, but psychology as a field yeah, tends to do, is just to look at variance and difference and then to pathologize it and call it some form of, you know, mental illness. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I just I just sort of laugh at that. So this idea that toxic masculinity is now a mental illness or that patriarchy exists like they can measure it in any quantifiable way mm -hmm. uh, is laughable now i'm not trying to i'm not trying to cast dispersions on the entire field of psychology i'm not trying to cast dispersions on all psychologists but you know for something like psychopathy we can give them a 20 point we can give people a 20 question um instrument pay, you know pen and paper sort of question i believe it's 20 questions don't hold me to that um you know, and the higher they score, the more psychopathy they have, mm -hmm. right? Good luck with patriarchy. <laughs> right? you know, what, give people an individual patriarchy scale, right? You know, where are you on the, you know, how much of a patriarchal bastard are you? Huh. Um, and it just, and the term toxic masculinity, it has no academic reference whatsoever. It's not an academic term. It's not defined in academic terms. There's no instrument to measure toxic masculinity. It is a term that emerged from social justice warriors, feminists from the far left mm -hmm. to demonize the entirety of men. Yeah. And they've done a damn good job with the term. So can, really... we, can we measure masculinity then? Yeah, you can. Well, so, okay, so masculinity is a bit of a slippery fish, right? And that. Yeah. The first thing is most scholars don't define what they mean by masculinity. Masculinity is either a set of behaviors mm -hmm. and characteristics that any human being can achieve, whether they're male, female, cisgender, trans, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or masculinity is generally how we describe the gendered behaviors of men. And for most of history, we're talking about cis men here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I'm, I think I'm the only masculinity scholar I know of that clearly states in his research, masculinity for me is a description of the current status of how cisgendered males act. Okay. okay. 
But I understand that there's a set of behaviors that we would all classify as masculine if you wanted to. And that's fine. But we need to be clear about what we're talking about. And yes, of course, being emotionally stoic and risk taking and violence and, you know, all of those sorts of things are associated with masculinity. But at the same time, so are the positives that come from them. Mm -hmm. The types of risk taking that goes on in business, the types of violence that's used when men interfere with innocent people to protect them. So these are all masculine mm -hmm. traits. And the, you know, and like all of us, you know, your your best trait is also your worst trait, mm -hmm. right? Your, your, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. And that is the same with masculinity. The desire for men to take risk is what enables companies to grow. It's what enables um, you know, science to succeed, but it's also, you know, why 10,000 YouTubers do these stupid ass things on YouTube and you know, when they jump off cliffs with wingsuits and shit. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's the same, you know, it, it, it has good and, and bad principles to it. But let me tell you what the term toxic masculinity has done. I'll give you my basic stick here and what and what I do. Okay. So, um, so in 1993, I came out of the closet as America's first openly gay high school coach. I was 25 years old and I was able to come out because in 1992, Bill Clinton was talking about running for presidential office and he wore a gay pride necklace on Saturday Night Live and he started talking about allowing gays to serve in the US military. And it radically changed the cultural discourse mm. because where it was a uh, heterosexual community um, you know, disparaged gays and said, oh, well, we don't want gays to have special rights. In terms of the military, it was reversed. And they said, well, wait a minute, you know, what, why do these gays not have to serve in the military? They should have equality to serve in the military. Okay. So it really changed the cultural dialogue. And it also happened at the same time in which HIV began to, began to be recognized as a heterosexual problem, not just a gay problem. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at all the large scale studies on homophobia, Cultural homophobia began to dip dramatically, and it has dropped dramatically ever since. <laughs> that was my um, moment to come out. You know, I, I sensed the change in the air, and I came out of the closet. I was met with a great deal of homophobia. Unfortunately, this, was, at this high school, from the parents, he, from the students, from the mostly from the American football team, uh, from other high school students, from other athletes on other teams, not from my own athletes or my own parents. Hmm. Um, and that makes sense with the social science literature, you know, it's, it's harder to hate somebody once you know who they are. Yes. Right? So long story short, um, the principal body of research, our basic understanding of how men operate from both psychology and sociology was established in the 1970s and then principally in the 1980s. That's when the whole field of masculinity studies really began, it was the 1980s. And the 1980s was the most homophobic period of time. It was the Rambo era. It was mm. a bunch of straight men running around proving they weren't gay. Uh, it was really hyper macho, right? And, and in the 1990s, from the moment I came out and onwards, masculinity has been softening. Every generation of men from the 1980s onwards has been softer and softer. And so what I've done with my research is through quantitative research, qualitative research, ethnographic research, dozens and dozens of studies across the United States and in the United Kingdom, in the media, outside the media, in sport, outside of sport, in religion, outside of religion, is I've shown and, and, and a body of scholars who use my theoretical framework have shown definitively, without doubt, without question, that men, boys and men are getting softer and more inclusive with basically each passing year. No doubt. The relationship between this declining homophobia and the softening of masculine and the softening of masculinity is salient. It's obvious. When men are afraid to be thought gay, what straight men cannot do is prove that they are straight. Mm -hmm. So they run around going, you faggot, look at the you know, look yeah. at the boobs on her, right? Say so hypersexualized women and they avoid anything associated with femininity at all, whether that be emotions or occupations or sports or art or entertainment or anything at all that's associated with femininity, they avoid. And that was the 1980s. We lived in a polarized world. Men did this, women did that. Mm. And, you know, any man who ventured towards femininity, fag. Yeah. And had Today, to completely embrace it and become overly 
Uh, Unless they were, yeah, yeah, a few could, right? Or if they were a rock star, you know, for some reason, David Bowie was able to get away with things (laughs) that nobody else, you know? All those hair bands in the late 80s, though, too. Yes, absolutely. And there were, you know, there there was these these performers in the 80s who, you know, I knew I was gay, but I had no idea that Boy George was gay or that David Uh, Bowie, or you know, or Queen, you know, it's like Freddie Mercury's like, what? You know, I had no idea because didn't really think they could be. Mm-hmm. At any rate, um, so when straight men don't have to defend their heterosexuality, when they don't really care if people think they're gay or not, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden they have the freedom to partake in all of those once feminized things. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I show is happening with youth. So, you know, your average teenage boy today is wearing skinny jeans, they've got purple underwear, yeah. they're not afraid to go into a service oriented job, they've got gay friends. And they're just not as invested in this, look at me, look how macho I am, look how straight I am. So at the very same time, that definitively, without doubt, violence is down, homophobia is down, Hmm. um, even straight men suggesting that they are are having uh, premarital sex is down, Uh, smoking is down, team sport participation is down. So men are just becoming softer and nicer. Hmm. And at the exact same time that men are getting softer and softer and softer, the discourse against men is getting higher and higher and higher. And this is a discourse that's driven by the liberal left. Now, 20 years ago, I used to fear, or just 15 years ago, I used to fear my conservative students, you know, particularly the Christian conservatives, that that they would take some issue with the fact that I was gay or, you know, Mm -hmm. the data I present or whatnot. Today, ask any scholar, any academic, it's not the conservatives we fear anymore. Hmm. It's the far left. It's the fundamentalist illiberal left that we fear hmm. who make nothing out of every – I'm sorry, they make everything out of nothing, right? You know, there's no – and there's no grave for them. There's no – you know, there's no, oh, well, he said something I don't like, but hey, I like all these other things. It's he said something I don't like, have him fired, don't allow him to speak here, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. And so um, that illiberal left has been growing. Yeah, and with it has come a uh, antipathy towards males, a misandry, if you will. So at the same time, men are be- getting better and better and softer and nicer and mm-hmm. becoming better fathers and gay friends, and they're having bromances like crazy. At the same time, they're <laughs> the same time men are doing all the things women have asked them to do. The discourse against men as a whole is absolutely and rapidly on the rise well it's it's toxic in and of itself and what is the effect of this what what is the effect of this discourse on the psyches of young men or or just men men in general does it force them to become even more softer or more harder to direct their hardness towards uh you know like uh i guess anything that uh doesn't line up with the narrative the ultra left narrative empirically I can't say. I, I can't speak from data. And wh- one of the things I like to do as a scholar, I like to say, here's what I'm saying based on data. And everything I've said to you so far has been based on data. I don't have the evidence to know how the diatribe, the, the, the misandry that we see affects young men. Um, I kind of think that they may just think, well, who the fuck cares? Right? Who cares? Um, and, and I just, you know, I'll give you an example. One example does not prove the rule. This is not scientific. Um, but I remember some research I was doing on a uh, college out here in the United Kingdom, and these two boys, ostensibly straight boys, uh, were lying on the grass, and they were doing as young boys in England do a lot. Um, and I mean, it's almost compulsory part of friendship. They were physically entwined with each other. So one boy had his head on the other boy's stomach, and they were essentially cuddling in the sunshine on the grass right after school. And these, these girls walk by, and they say, oh, God, you look gay. And the boy's response just ignore them. And then the girl said, don't you even care that you look gay? The boys just ignore them. So I kind of think they don't care. They're mm. doing their thing. They're happy with what they do. I've just completed a, a, large, a large study on bromances. And 50% of the men in a bromance say that they take more joy and value their bromance more than they do their heterosexual romances. 
So a bromance is a, is an emotional bond between two ostensibly hetero uh, heterosexual males, or is it is yep. it's an emotional bond without necessarily a sexual aspect? That's correct. Yeah. So two okay. straight men in love. If you've ever watched Scrubs, it's Turk and DJ. Yeah. I think his name's DJ. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that's a bromance, and they are defined differently than a friendship. A friendship for men has always been defined by and continues to be defined by they do things together. Mm-hmm. If you play video games together, you drink beer together, you play sports together, you have a friend. Women traditionally have said that they have a friend when they share secrets, they they you know they they relate to each other in that emotional capacity, that they show vulnerabilities and secrets with each other. Today, men have a friendship when they do things together, and they have a bromance hmm. when they share secrets, they show vulnerabilities, they're mm-hmm. there for each other emotionally. When they say, I love you, hmm. and it may be, I love you, bro, I love yeah. you, man, but they say love, and that, that's incredibly common, and they text love, and they text kisses, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> this is just normal, standard behavior over here in the UK for teenage boys. <laughs> it is absolutely normal, right? And it comes with a great deal of physicality, of kissing on the lips, on the cheeks, of cuddling, of all sorts of physicality. Huh. So the bromance has offers men a lot. Um, and 50% of the guys say that they find their bromance as much or more enjoyable than their heterosexual romances. Hmm. Um, obviously, the heterosexual romance has the advantage of, you know, sex. Yeah. But, but the, which comes with a bunch of consequences, potentially. Which comes with, oh, yes, of course, yes. It's a big nine month one if they're not careful. Yeah. Um, and then the, um, but the heterosexual bromances, they say, you know, if I, ha- this is kind of what, they all said this to some degree. If I have an argument with my bromance, he forgives me or is over it five minutes later. If I have an argument with my Hmm. romance, she brings it up again five months later. And there's this idea that, you know, that they're sort of nagged by women. Um, And there's also this idea that um, they have to behave and act in certain ways around women, including their girlfriends, that they can't be their their genuine Hmm. selves around girls. But around the guys, they can be their genuine selves without fear of being judged. Surprise, surprise. Hmm. Right. And so, they're, so you know, men are now doing all of the things that women have asked them to do. They're doing the childcare. They're, you know, they're being more emotional. They're being sensitive. They're not being macho. They're not fighting. Right? You know, the rates, the rates of school violence in terms of fights, it's preposterous. I mean, it's, you know, I just asked just, just two days ago on Friday, I asked my students, how many of you have ever been in a fight in your life? And of the 15 male students in class, not one had ever been in a fight in his life. I do throw in the qualification, your sibling doesn't count, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, okay. And I did throw in the qualification of like, I think I said from 10 and above, right? Because, you know. Yeah, yeah, kids. yeah. But um, not that I'm condoning that, but, you know, kids are more likely to fight than teenagers. And so, you know, there, men have become what women have wanted them to be. In fact, women are making as much money as men up to the age of 30 in the workforce. They're graduating from university in higher numbers. Yeah. Um, they're having higher degrees. They're graduating with higher degrees. Um, you know, so men are doing what women have always wanted them to do. And so, at the same time, men are doing this. It is wholly unfair that they're being lambasted with this idea of toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you what the term toxic masculinity, I believe, has done. Now, again, there's no way to measure this with data. So this is just my own personal opinion. But I believe that. We used to talk about individual aspects. We used to say things, for example, like, you know, this is what it means to be a man. Are men not emotional enough? And so we'd look at a little sliver of that pie, right? And we would ask questions. We'd write articles, you know, are men are men not emotional enough? Should men be more emotional? And we were looking at one attribute of a whole. And today we just say toxic mm. masculinity. Mm-hmm. Oh. He's not being emotional, toxic masculinity. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we are lambasting the entirety of being male through this idea of toxic masculinity. So what toxic masculinity has become, it's become the epithet. It's become mm-hmm. the N word of men. It's become the F word of gay people. Mm-hmm. Toxic masculinity is, you know, it's this, it's this, yeah. it's an insult. It's, uh, you know, it's an insult. It's an absolute insult. And so it totalitizes, it totalitizes men as toxic. Yeah. You know, have you seen the Gillette commercial? Yeah, I've done a breakdown of it, frame okay. by frame almost, yeah. 
Right. So, you know, I mean, it's one trope after another trope after another right, trope. Right. You know, and of course, you notice, by the way, that it's the, you know, it's the black man stopping the white men from doing bad. Because I try to avoid that, but if, <laughs> that was very evident. Said, culturally speaking, if we just said black men have toxic masculinity, or, you know, if we said black men do this, you know, that's not acceptable. But you can just say all men. That, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Right. Um, but they play this, you know, they play the some most language. They say, you know, of course, some men aren't doing this mm-hmm. which or of course some work. men are good, which, you know, makes it sound like three percent, you know, when the reality is it's almost all men are decent. Are, and are policing each other or, or putting uh, pressure on each other to act in, in a certain way to, to live up to a certain standard. Almost all men do not physically do not act physically aggressive to their partners or other people. Almost all men do not, um, uh, you know, um, commit crimes. Yeah. Right? If you look at rape crimes, for example, amongst white men, it's five out of a hundred thousand. Right. So, I mean, that's horrible five men, yeah. but you know, that's a very low percentage. The, the so argument the, didn't frame it as, of course, most men don't do this. Right, kind of like the Me Too thing, you know. Most men are not Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, your average male who's going to work to try to put bread on the on the table, is being an egalitarian husband, is being a good father, is is subjected to this, you know, men. Look how awful you are. Mm-hmm. And it's the, it's discrimination. It's you know, it's the gone. argument that I've heard against the most men defense oh you you're even mocked when you say not all men like that that's now a point of mockery um but even even if most men aren't criminals most criminals are men right so the Um, problem is still the men that's that's what i've heard yes so there is absolutely no doubt that men commit more violent crime than women no doubt and most of that crime is also committed against other men so men are also the victims of violent crime yeah. far more than women. And when men do commit crimes, whether they be violent, drug offenses, or other forms of nonviolent crime, they receive disproportionately longer sentences in prison for the exact same crime when women commit. Mm-hmm. So if a man and a woman are both caught doing crime X, and they both have a clear record and you know no, no priors, the man is going to go to jail longer than the woman. Because he poses so, more threat to society. I mean, isn't that the calculus? It's, it's 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 subconscious bias or perhaps conscious bias of the judge. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And and obviously, with a higher percentage of African Americans in prison, um, you know, there may be some. Uh, there, there probably, almost certainly, would be some racist element to mm-hmm. many of the sentences, right? Because mm-hmm. remember, judges have discretion in the sentences they give, with the exception of um, some large scale federal drug crimes. Um, you know, where the where the Reagan brought in laws where the judges have no discretion. My mom's a judge. She has discretion. You know, the law says two to 10 years. You give your, you know, the judge gives what they think is appropriate. So, you know, personal bias comes into play. Um, so, you know, yes. So men do commit more violent crime. They don't commit more violent crime domestically. Women commit just as much hmm. battery of their spouses as men do. The difference is when women do it, they tend to use objects. The difference is when women do it, the police don't take it as seriously. The difference is when women do it, men are far less likely to report it than women are. Or the friends of men are less likely to report it than the friends of women, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But we've known this for years. This is, you know, this is not Mickey Mouse science. This is um, Department of Justice statistics that men and men and women commit the same amount of violent crime. So most of the violent crime that men commit, unfortunately, is also against other men. Not that it should be against women, but you know, it's unfortunate that violent crime happens. Men go to war where they kill other men. Mm -hmm. Women aren't drafted into those wars. Women aren't expected to fight in those wars. And in most countries, women are not even permitted to be on the front lines to fight in them. But then the argument against that is that war is the product of patriarchy. War is the product of men. So of course, men are participating in this toxic masculinity that, that has seeped through all of our culture for all time. Yes, and women women are all just these heavenly angels who would never send their troops to war, <laughs> right? Which is why when you look at the kings and queens of England, who sent more men to their deaths? Kings or queens? I don't queens. know. Queens. Queens. Queens, right? So, you know, hmm. uh, who, you know, who who sent who sent Britain to fight over the stupid Falkland War off of Argentina? And one of, had one of our large Navy vessels, our, the British large Navy vessels, sunk. And however many hundreds or thousands of men die. 
wasn't a male, right? And so, you know, so this idea that only men send troops into war and commit atrocities, give me a break, Mm -hmm. right? Women do the same. Hmm. They just don't have, they're just not in the positions of power as much as men, so they don't get the stick for it. Yeah. Do you, have you studied the relationship between acculturation of the male and the biological? What, what influences the emergent properties, yes. properties of a man and what, what directs or shapes those properties? Yes. And this is the, um, the illiberal left, the far left. Um, they tend to believe that everything is socially constructed. Yeah. That, you know, who you are and that gender is entirely socially constructed, except for when it comes to transgender issues. Then they go, oh, well, no, that person was born a male in a female body or vice versa. And you, and you just kind of want to stop and go, wait a minute, I, I thought everything was socially constructed. I thought that men's gendered behaviors were purely socially constructed. Oh, so biology does have a play here when it comes to transgender folks, but not when it comes to cisgender folks, right? Um, and, you know, and these wars have been going on for um, – you know, decades about yeah. how much of masculinity and femininity is biological, yeah. how yeah. much of it is socially constructed. There is no doubt that whatever biology has offered us, society tends to exaggerate. I think we're all in agreement on that. I'm aware of no biological determinist who believes that society has no impact whatsoever. But I know a lot of sociologists who think that it's all socially constructed that we are born blank slates, male and female. And because the little boy babies are tossed in the air more than little girl babies, it turns them into Arnold Schwarzeneggers, right? Complete and utter rubbish. And the way we can empirically prove this is by looking at what we call the gender paradox. Now the gender paradox is only a paradox to social constructionists. For your viewers who don't know what a social constructionist is, it's, you know, you're born a blank slate and you, because of your influences of growing up, your parents or society, you become who you are because of them. So the gender paradox is in the countries that have the highest degree of gender equality as ranked by large scale indexes by the United Nations, i.e. Sweden, Norway, They also have the highest degree of gender segregation Hmm. in the occupational workforce and the highest degree of gender segregation in terms of subjects that they study for in university, right? And the reason is because these highly advanced gender equal feminist countries have squashed incomes, high tax rates, right? Uh And and lower and high lower income rates so that essentially you can live a good life and raise a family off of being a child care provider yes so what this means is really you know you can choose to be a scientist or this or that you can work in the fields of stem science technology engineering and math which have been and remain dominated by men or you can work in the service industry the child care industry right which are dominated by women and in those countries, there are there is much greater gender segregation than there are in countries like Rwanda with very little feminist practice. Yeah. And that's because in the poorer countries, um, in the countries who are not as gender advanced as we are so lucky to be here in the West, um, you know, women go into STEM because that's the topic that makes the most money and they need the money for their for their family sort of thing so what that study what you know what the, the nordic countries show us is when you leave men and women to their own devices um financially and you infiltrate the culture with messages of more boys into teaching more you know more women into stem and you make a huge effort to get women to move into stem they're not going to do it on their own accord hmm. and that's because they are not biologically as interested in taking the risk and so if you look at the the if you look at the um the difference between men and women in the occupational sector i say that men exist in the top jobs top of pay top stands for top of pay and those are you know from ceos and businessmen and so forth and these are men who've taken huge risk and spent an an unbelievable amount of their family life of their health establishing this top of pay yeah. And then men also exist at the very bottom in the dregs of jobs. Yeah. You know, the, the oil platform workers, the guys who remove the dead bodies, the, um, you know, the street cleaners, the, gar- the garbage men, all of these dirty and dangerous jobs. I call them dad jobs, hmm. dirty and dangerous. <laughs> 
where do women fit into this? Women fit in in the middle slice. I call those slice jobs. Slice stands for safe, lower income employment. Okay. They're indoor jobs. They're service oriented. They're regular hours. They're not high risk. They're paid enough, but they're not, you know, they're never going to be the top and they're not going to be at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But it is by far disproportionately men who are at the bottom of the occupational and the life sector. Men have, men die earlier. Homelessness is almost exclusively men. There are 4,500 deaths a year in the, in the occupational industry in the United States. Only 200 of those are women. The rest mm. are men in these ridiculous, dangerous, and dirty jobs. And so men are willing to take more risks. And you, you got to be a fool if you don't think biology has some influence on yeah. this. You just yeah. have to be – well, you know, you don't have to be a fool. You have to be a fundamentalist. <laughs> And the far left has become fundamentalist. They've done a flip-flop with the far right. Yeah. They, they've completely swapped positions, the far left and the far right, you know, on, you know, on, on all sorts of things, uh, in, you know, including, well, all sorts of things. But um, so, yeah, you have to be a fundamentalist not to go, hmm, maybe biology has some play here. Well, in, in order to push back against the onslaught of misandrist media, um, and we, we can go in and, and look at wh why the whole gender pay gap is, is such a feminist issue and why it seems like they're always, they're always fighting for the, the high profile jobs. They're never fighting for, you know, the bricklayer ever. In, for sure. in, they're never running towards that. They're always that trying to sure. shame and get get to the top because they want profile. And it seems like the people who want the profile don't necessarily want to put in the work. They want to have society put in the work so they can get ahead. I think and, it's a bit more devious than that. I think they want to play the victim card. Really? I think I think the, the far left and particularly feminists are big on victimization. What a victim I am. What a victim I am. I'm such yeah. a victim. And I think it's I think it's far more devious than you're making it out to be. Mm. I think they absolutely love because you know here here's here's a, a challenge. Any of your any of your viewers who I'm sure probably most of your viewers agree with your viewpoints, which is probably why they're watching you, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. For, for any who don't, right? Um, so I, I tell all my sociology friends, you know, there are thousands of gender scholars who subscribe to the discipline of sociology. Go into Google, type in scholar, pull up Google Scholar, and type in gender paradox, and count how many sociologists have ever studied the gender paradox. And I find it ironic that, you know, all of these feminists are saying, you know, we need more programs to promote gender equality. But when those programs are actually put into place, like the way they are in Norway, like they are in Scandinavia, look at the outcomes mm -hmm. and tell us what those outcomes are. No, they don't do it. In fact, none, zero have. I am, as far as I know, the only sociologist who has written about the gender paradox. And I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it until a year ago. I'm a professor of masculinity. And what a what a shame, what a disgrace to my upbringing, to my masculinity heritage, that I didn't know about the gender paradox. And how did I learn about it? <laughs> Read it. I learned about <laughs> it from men's rights activists. Hmm. I thought, what is this men's rights activist stuff? And I got into it and I said, wow, these guys are on it. They're research informed, mm. they're logical, and they're right mm. in so many of these issues. They're very, so, very maligned, though. I mean, they're they like are, one step removed from incels, the, right? They're truth speakers. Yeah. So now type in women CEO or Fortune 500 women. And there's, you know, it's just mm. a shitload of, of sociologists who've studied that problem. So let me, so this is what this tells me about the field of feminist sociology. They care more about the woman who is only making $200 million a year compared to the man who's making $900 million a year than they do to actually achieving gender equality and doing something to make women and men more equal hmm. than they do about um, the homelessness than they do about men dying in shit jobs than they do about men being locked behind bars for longer than women. Yeah. They're not interested in the plight of men. Hmm. They're interested in women having more positions of capitalistic power. And then, then you just go, wow. Yeah. Right. Go you fight. A for lot capital. of them are kind of uh, self-professed Marxists as well, which, and that's what I find so funny. It's like, right, go you self-professed Marxists. 
liberal, socialist, you know, communist. Yeah, you know, you advocate for more women to be in, you know, CEOs. And then they have this magical, they have this magical belief system that, you know, when women get to these positions, they're going to be, you know, ethical. No. Yeah. You know, corporations aren't ethical because they're beholden to the, to the board who is made up of the stockholders who only care about profit, including me, right? Yeah, we'll, so. we'll see how this mo- uh, quote-unquote most uh, f- most female uh, Congress will end up being. Like, I'm sure it'll just be more the same. More the same. Of course it will be. Wait, do you think women aren't going to be, you know, uh, manipulated by politics, by political influences and forces? Of course not. Of course what, they will be. Uh, what about male suicide? And yep. how do we how do we confront that positively? Let, let's leave like let's leave the it, uh, the the misandry of, of yeah. the culture behind and, and like focus on something positive that men can do um, for themselves or for each other to help with that suicide rate. So I'm a bit nihilistic on that. Really, um, I I have some hope that the bromance will give men somebody to connect to to open up to, to turn to, that romances might have a positive implication for men's suicide. I have that hope. But for decades now, women have attempted suicide tenfold compared to men, hmm. and men have committed suicide tenfold compared to women. Hmm. And the reason is because men have that risk part of their DNA, and men choose more lethal methods. They jump and they shoot, and women take pills, and they get discovered. And, you know, when they send the text saying, come over, whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So I have very little hope that um, we're going to make much progress in that capacity. Sad to say. Have you looked at why, uh, uh, what that, where that suicide rate comes from? And do you think that, like, an understanding of a positive conception of masculinity would help with that? Or is that just um, individual psyches going through significant? Yeah, depression? I mean, you know, it, again, we're talking. I believe the U.S. suicide rate is something like seven out of a hundred thousand, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, and of course, suicide rate is um, far higher amongst some minorities, particularly transgender folks, for example. Um, whether it's you know endogenic disease, whether it's just life circumstances, I'm not an expert enough to say, um, but because men choose more lethal methods, yeah. if men and women are subject to the same social conditions. So if you live in this perfect gender equality that, you know, that Norway feminism desires, um, and men and women do the exact same thing and think the exact same way and all of that, I still think that men are going to commit suicide in far higher rates than women. And I think that's just a biological reality of the way men act and the risks men take. Is there is there like a can can you give us like a summation? I know you've done more than one article, but I read one article where you put forth like the difference between orthodox masculinity and like kind of a a newer, more positive masculinity. Yeah. Now you you'll notice the difference between again you know the word toxic masculinity has no academic validity to it whatsoever. Okay. And you notice the difference between what I title orthodox masculinity. Yes and toxic masculinity. Now what orthodox masculinity means is old school masculinity. It means orthodox. Orthodox means old. It means traditional, right? Okay. And and so, you know, with that traditional masculinity, yes, comes a set of these descriptions, but the term orthodox masculinity is a bit more neutral, yeah, right? It's it just more describes it as orthodox, right? And then you can put your own values on it if you want, but you know, it is essentially just orthodox. So, um, uh, so yeah, so orthodox masculinity is the type of masculinity that we largely mapped out in the 1980s. And it, it's, there's basically five things that men need to be. They need to be uh, stoic, right? Mm-hmm. They need to be, you know, emotionally stoic and hold their fear and, and all of that. And, you know, and, and stoicism has its place in turn of the 20th century industrial America where men are going down in the coal mines, they're dying of black lungs, collapsed lungs, helium releases, the whole bit, right? Mm. Or they're having their limbs chopped off in the in, in the factories, or or they have to jump out of the trenches in World War One and run across and fight other men while machine guns are going off over their heads. So, you know, stoicism has its place there. And so you can see where stoicism came from. And number two is, you know, uh, avoid anything feminine, right? Any any feminine field which could pollute your idea of masculinity. Number three is like be a leader. And it's if you're not a leader of men, then you have to be a loner of men. So you know you're either you're either John Wayne or you're the Marlboro Man, 
right out there on the plains alone and you're you know you're your own independent man yeah um, number four is absolutely and this is the biggest one is you know have no association with no admittance of no homosexual thought whatsoever you got to be you know you got to be entirely heterosexual and then there's an element of uh, men take risks okay. right men suck it up um, men do what's required um you know men um men provide and so that so there's these five tropes of of masculinity but let's let's look to what youth are doing today um so number one do men care about being uh hetero well, i'll get the i'll get the order wrong but do men care about being you know perceived to be heterosexual and are they afraid to of are they afraid to have any form of homosocial intimacy or homosexual mm. contact no, not at all. Definitively, the research is very clear about that. Um, you know, men are, you know, they may still be straight, but they're gayer than they've ever been. Right? So that, <laughs> right? What about association with femininity? Well, you know, purple is now fashionable for men, pink underwear, all yeah. sorts of all sorts of things that were once highly taboo. You know, remember, you, you're old enough to remember, like, when the one-strap bag used to be called a purse, and then men started wearing the one-strap yeah. bag. Whereas, when I first saw that, I thought, oh my God, these guys are wearing purses, right? You know, so, you know and you know, when I did my PhD on male nurses, uh, at that time, 5% of, of, of nurses were male. And uh, one of the colleges that I did my study at, I just went back to the summer, and they're up to 30% of men. Okay. So men are now working, Stephen Roberts shows that men are working in the service oriented orientation. The, the youth that work in clothing stores, even selling female clothing, have no idea that this used to be a highly feminized, highly taboo thing for young straight boys to do. So they're associating with femininity. In terms of stoicism, it's not there anymore. They're, you know, I mean, it started with Leonardo DiCaprio and it's just gone out the window, emos, and, you know, you know, these men are texting, I love you, and they're saying, you know, and they're huh. Facebook, you know they're, you know, they're incredibly emotional with each other. Just go on any use Facebook and you'll see them all over each other saying, I love you, man, bros forever, you know, and all that. Yeah. So the emotional intimacy is there. The leadership thing. Um, it's you know leadership is a is a is a quality, but you know I don't I don't see men like striving for it to the point where they're going to step on other people. In other words, these guys are just soft. Yeah. Let me let me give you some data, and I'll also send you the slide in case you want to incorporate it into the YouTube. So we asked team sport athletes, rugby players and and soccer players over here in England. The N was about 200, it's about 235, I think it was in total, and we gave them the scale, like you know totally masculine to totally feminine and we broke it down by age group and the older guys the 55 to whatever their average their mean was totally masculine hmm. and then as you go down the scale they got farther and farther away from that so when you got to the 18 to 22 year olds their mean was some was slightly more masculine than feminine oh, okay and none of the guys said totally masculine Right, so there's this huge, statistically ginormous effect Change, yeah. that shows that each generation is distancing themselves from masculinity, which is why this Gillette ad is such a wrong time and a wrong place. Mm. They should look to what Lynx did. You know, Lynx said, masculinity today, it's anything you want it to be. And mm. they showed 15 different types of masculinity. It's a positive, aspiring message. Yeah, the pop exactly. noodle commercial. You know, it's a pot noodle commercial your viewers can YouTube. It's a fantastic masculinity pot noodle commercial. It's this boy getting buff. You think it's because he wants to be the boxer, but in the end, he's holding up the sign for the, you know, uh, you know, round four sign, and he's got like a halter top on. <laughs> right? and, and his family's at home going, yeah, he did it. He made it to the professional league, right? So it's just aspirational. Yeah. It's not you suck men commercial. Yeah. It's... it's you know, men, you can be anything you want today. The shackles are off men yeah. just the way they are off women. Yeah. And do you think that that contributes or has like a negative effect, like that softening? Does that make a uh, society more susceptible or is that the outcome of, of progress? Is that the outcome of wealth? Will that make it uh, more difficult for future generations to be more decisive, to to fight stronger fights like like the decline in stoicism let's say will that not like kind of erode certain sorts of strong structures in society there are some elements of men's rights who argue this when they argue that for example um, the lack of that stoicism prevents men from killing themselves uh, and I argue no okay. it hasn't okay. right um, and so yeah there so there is a question, like, you know, uh, one of my friends, Mike Buchanan, who's a, sort of a leader of the men's rights activist groups, um, you know, he says, well, you know, you know, we should, we should question if men are 
stoic and risk taking and all of that, then what happens if we have another war? And I kind of laughed and I said, Mike, you know, they they get everything they need from war by doing this on their computers because, you know, mm. the nature of modern warfare is no longer sending, you know, standing armies to run over a muddy hill against other standing armies. So what their masculinity also does is not only reflect decreasing homophobia, but it deflects it reflects uh, decreasing economic opportunity. Youth today have no chance of buying a house in, you know, outside of certain states in America, right? You know, the, 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 the industry has been shipped overseas, the, you know, the, the bubble has burst, the whole bit. University, you know, they come out of, in the UK, you know, university was free 20 years ago, and now it's 9,500 pounds a year in an, in a, in an economy in which 2,300 is the average income. So, you know, it's a huge expense and a huge debt, right? So what's happening with youth is they are focused less on owning a home and focus more on having experiences, mm -hmm. traveling, doing things, posting it on Facebook, you know, all that sort of stuff. And this, the, our economy has moved to a service sector. Yeah. And so boys need to be soft for a service sector. They, you know, nobody wants to run into a hyper macho guy behind the counter. So, you know, that's not going to do the business very well. Yeah. So their masculinity also reflects the requirements of their current culture. So I don't see mm. this as having a negative impact on their lives. I see this as them an adaptation. In, an ad thank you. It's an adaptation to the modern economy. Hmm. So yeah. So no, I don't see it as being. Uh, I don't see it as being highly problematic. Hmm. I, I really. I have to go soon. And I'm sorry that okay. this is such a no short interview because there's so many things that you have to say. <laughs> I did have oh one question. Just to another day. Are, are when when you, you spoke about your research into the bromance yes is do men tend to be more monogamous with their bromances than they are with their romances is there a tendency yeah. to be monogamous yeah. with those are they do they do they have like group bromances or is it usually one-on-one -on -one? Uh, yeah it's not really group romance they're, they're not monogamous with their bromances okay um they um yeah, I mean, sometimes there will be, you know, guys in a bromance with another guy and so forth be a triadic sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. But for the most part, it's just that they have the opportunity to have bromances with more than one individual without it being uh, a mark of jealousy, without, you know, without people being upset by the fact that they're doing something else with their other bromance. Yeah. So what I see a lot in my studies of bromance is because I'm a university professor. Obviously, I study university guys because they're on my doorstep. So what I see a lot is, you know, I've got my bromance from back, my bromance from back home, and then I came to university and I met this guy, yeah. and he's my bromance here. And then I went to the play soccer and I met a guy on the team, and he's my bromance over there. And so I, they sort of the bromances come from these, you know, these different geographical areas. But no, they are, at, you know, the, the key to the question here is. Um, they're not required to be monogamous in their romantic relationships. And as as um, it seems like what you describe is this kind of uh, this distinction between the sexes of, of men having being more comfortable around other men and therefore tending to be around men. Do you think that that's going to cause friction, more and more friction and misunderstanding between the sexes because they're not uh, being having to exclusively you know hook up and having yeah. I, I think a lot of feminine well. I think a lot of feminists won't like my findings, and I think this is one of those things that men are damned if they do and damned if they don't. Uh, I've already received a lot of backlash from feminists over the fact that, you know, we've argued that what the bromance does is it frees men up to um, avoid making decisions about romances until they're really quite ready. Because the bromance gives them the – it doesn't give them the orgasmic physicality, but it gives them the, the emotional and physical tactility. And it allows them to make decisions about having a girlfriend to delay that, right? And, you know, because the modern economy means they're not going to get married on average until they're 30 and not going to have children until just at the very end of egg-bearing years. And because they are able to access recreational heterosexual sex, why have a girlfriend? Hmm. You can go to the club. You can meet a girl. You can meet a different girl the next week. You can have recreational sex, and you can have all of the intimacy that comes with the bromance. And so what we argue is that the bromance is, is um, along with the economic necessities, 
is extending adolescence. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, I'd argue that within seven years or so, the idea of what it means to be an adolescent in terms of, you know, being engaged with the work world and family and mortgages and all that will be extended till until 30 years of age. Is this so segregation going to problematize the relationship between men, like learning how to understand women and w women learning how to understand men, especially with all this misandry going on, castigating sure. men and, and driving that further? I, I would not want to be a heterosexual male in today's climate. <laughs> I'm so much overhead. <laughs> I would not, you, you know, I, 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 listen, I often look to my, I have to look to my, my straight male students. And I just think your life would be so much easier if you were gay. Hmm. So much in this, in this day and age, so much easier. I wouldn't say that in the 1980s, but today. Interesting. Oh, wow. Interesting. So easier. Let's leave it at that as a teaser. And I'm going to try to, organize a time when we can speak again if that's cool with you sure absolutely can continue this i have to run off to my work job but, no problem yeah go thanks a lot eric this is wonderful i'll put your you want everybody going to your website is there yeah, sure. other Great. portals sure. i'll, I'll link your twitters your tweeters your tweet or two uh, i i i uh i kill twitter oh okay yeah Shut it's up. just people screaming into a void isn't it huh it's just angry. It's just to, what can you say in a tweet? And, well, they're, they're screaming together into a void, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to avoid wasn't. the life outside. I like this sort of long format thing yeah. where you can talk about your ideas and, you know, okay. not be castigated for what you said in 40 characters, you know, sort yeah. of thing. Excellent. So, uh, but so just the website, perfectly fine. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good okay. night.